So uh, let's get right into this. Okay. Uh, we've, we've talked a lot over the past month or so, yeah. and it's been great getting to know you. Um, but what I usually like to ask first of artists during these discussions is a little bit about how you first came to your creative practice. Um, I'm curious, if uh, did you always gravitate toward photography, or is, was, was there another sort of art form that first piqued your interest? I remember when I was like in elementary school wanting an easel, but there's no reference anywhere that shows that I ever made a painting or did anything with it. I was bad about wanting to do something and then leaving. Um, so there's, I don't know where it came from, honestly. When I went to college at the uh, University of Sydney, very well. So while I was there, I had a good friend who took a lot of pictures, and he did pictures of, you know, he was always going camping and hiking and there were pictures of Telluride and on the beach and sunsets and I really liked it and decided that you know if I wanted to do that I got a camera and really wasn't thinking about it anything other than sort of like that and uh, his girlfriend Katie asked me to take a night class with her and I really wasn't interested in the class but I was really interested in the girl so that's what got me into the side of it. So I followed her to this class. She never went back at the end of the class. Um, they did a slide presentation of the masters. Yeah, another one I can tell you for sure I saw was Deanne Artis. Yeah. And so I guess there's two girls. It was Katie May, who I followed to the class, and Deanne Artis. They really just kind of spun me. I mean, from that point on, I never really shot the sunsets and that sort of thing very much. I just started spending all my time on the streets in Mobile or New Orleans, so, uh, so yeah. You know, then they, uh, the school said, we're going to put you back on academic probation after four years. <laughs> and Daddy wrote me this great letter that said, you know, I don't remember all that, it's a page and a half type, so I couldn't read it right. But he said, come home, we know you're, you know, you're not stupid, you figure it out, come home and let's regroup, you'll find your niche. That's the important thing. So I, I went home and uh, he was in Atlanta and talked about the Art Institute in Ringling. And I, three months later, I was living in Atlanta and went to the Art Institute in Atlanta. So you mentioned Diane Arbus. Are there, are there any other inspirations that led you to? I mean, that, I, I can see the influence in, yes. in certain yeah. photographs. You know, there's, there's things that I've shot that are close to hers. Um, I mean, I, it's always been about people. Leah Paulsman was a portrait shooter. I don't know if you know his work, but he was the picture who shot Salvador Dali when he was uh, through the cap through the air, and there was always people jumping. That was the Lee Paulsman. Um, Roy DeCarlo, who did it, uh, taught at Hunter College in New York and shot Harlem. And his prints, look up what you call his prints, are the most intense things and beautiful. I was in school and they taught me to have so much in the lights and highlights in these tunnel lanes. When I saw his prints and the first thought was he had like prints, but they were printed flatter and darker and it was just a, it created such a mood and it was a real lesson in it doesn't have to be this certain way. You can create your own voice with how you create the prints and how you shoot. I would say those three are the ones that in Cardiff I saw. And when you talk about tone and the printing technique, is that were, were they mostly monochrome or they were all all of that was black and white. All in black. Yeah, Arvis was all black and white. Um, Halsman, I'm sure they shot color. Halsman, everything I can tell you was always black and white. Um, Dakarva, a guy named George DeRoe, who's a painter, um, was the second show I ever saw where he shot people in the French Quarter who were painted without legs. All kind of crazy stuff. It, it was equally as powerful as artists in its own kind of strange way. So you're mostly looking for unique people. Yeah. Because I also noticed that you shoot really great just scenes of snapshots of daily life. Like I, I said it to you before, and I've heard other people that have seen the show just like this guy gets me. Yeah. He has my eye. Yeah. 
particular consistency is in my other work, I like to shoot portraits. Um, but I just drive around. A lot of people plan shoots. There's very little that I plan. There's a picture somewhere of homecoming. I knew I wanted to shoot homecoming because I remember that when I was a kid and I knew that the, that the girls had been wearing these hooded skirts since I was graduated in 76. I knew I wanted to go back to the, the little Dallas County Fair because uh, I just remembered all the colors and the sound. But most of it, I just get the car and I drive around. Uh, and I only drive 30, 40, 50 miles in a day and it takes me eight hours. And every time I see a little store, I go in and I buy a bottle of water. There's only like six bottles of water in my car during the day. But I never know who I'm going to meet or who I'm going to run into. And I love that connection. So when I'm riding around looking for people to talk to, I see, you know, the, the clothesline or this was, you know, I just get in the car and drive. And one day I head toward Crackle, and one day I go back over toward uh, Sprott, and I just see what I'm going to run into. And it's sort of a, you know, I look at other people's work and I go, wow, I wish I could do that. But they have people, there's a guy who came with out the time on. I mean, it was beautiful work, but he had somebody take him around. It looked like we're going to take you here and be shot. And he took him here. And the pictures are gorgeous, but they don't have, to me, that soul because he's not from there. He's not connecting with people organically. It's almost like a commercial shoot. And when you're driving around, I never would have known to find this little girl that I call um, Love Bug. You know? I saw the Confederate flag as I was zooming past, and it's like, I'm coming back this way, I'm going to stop. Or the guy who's sweeping on the roof. Um, that picture, you know, I mean, when I was standing there talking to him, and there was lightning in the air, he's standing on this tin roof. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. I'm like 83 years old on this roof, and that is sure I'm sweeping the roof. Those are the kind of things that you can't, you can't plan that. And that, that's, that's what I like, if you haven't expected or not knowing what I'm going to find. Yeah. So what really draws you to, I guess, pull the camera or pull your car off to the side of the road right. is just, it's, it's a feeling. It's an instinct. More so, yeah. it's an instinct. There's an early show I did in the, the title of Responding to Home. And that's what it is, it's a response. It's, a, <laughs> it's not an intellectual response, it's, a, it's, a, it's an emotional response to what I see and feel. I mean, you, you, you mentioned the man sweeping the roof, and that one, that one connected to me just because I was a very young child when I first like encountered the show Twin Peaks. Oh, yeah. And for me, that's like that's like an imagined scene from right. Twin Peaks, yeah. but it never existed in Twin Peaks. <laughs> and it, but it also sums up just like the strangeness of small small town life. There's these characters everywhere, and you're you're documenting them, but you're also documenting places. Um, you travel. Uh, what's 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 your setup? What is I guess your rig? Do you have uh, do you shoot film? Do you shoot digital? All the panoramas are shot with film. It's a panoramic panorama camera that shoots thirty five millimeter film. Um, but the way it's designed, the window in the back opens to twice the size. So instead of what is it, one mm -hmm. one and a half by three, it's what two to two to three is the proportion. So instead of two to three, it's two to six. So so these these images are shot with a 45 millimeter lens, which is like a standard lens. But if I was shooting with that 45 millimeter lens from here, I would get it to the other side of the deer heads to the clothesline. It's that wide, but you don't get any distortion because of the way that window is a that's another technical term opens up. So it's a really, it's a great camera. Those are shot on film. Um, everything else is shot digital. Um, there's a few images that are flying around with me all day of slide film that I really haven't done a deep dive to go back and see what I used to shoot. All of this work is from, Danny died in 2000. And when he died, I was going back to Selma more often and I was also bored in the my commercial work and I needed something different. Whenever I got bored, I found this camera. And so I bought this hand around and I shot the, and my friend said, you have a neat thing going of, of selling, you should continue. So I did that and then I went back with the 8x10, when you have deer doors, going for example, the long pattern, you know, 
underneath the shot in the 8x10. Um, we have some stuff here, we've kind of been jumping around, but that's sound of one when I was uh, 27. I did this PowerPoint, this is, you know, it's all about my parents and where I grew up in Salmon. Um, I was going to try to get to some of the 8 by 10 stuff. DNR, that's probably some of you probably recommend that. Probably one more fun. But this is some of the early work. Right after I was exposed to DNR, I was and started shooting on the streets in New Orleans and Mardi Gras. And what year are we looking at here? 77 to about 81. Wow. Yeah. Could have been a dream. Like, they could have been taken more seriously. Well, you know, Mardi Gras doesn't change. A lot of, you know, this guy could have been shot anywhere. Um, this is my mentor. I'll come back to this. But what I was trying to get to is the. Sorry. <laughs> well, yeah, not, not, not just. Saying spoilers, but you are quite an accomplished uh, portrait photographer as well. Yes, uh, that's that's my my first love. I mean, you know, shooting the people that I meet, you know, Mickey Anderson, you know, the different people is what I really love. Uh, the first book I did that I just read through was called Facing South, and it was a hundred portraits of Alabama of Southern artists, and I went Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, North and South Carolina. And uh, it took me 17 years to do it. Um, I'm working on the project now. <clears throat> It'll come out at the end of next year. And it's all South Carolina artists. And it will open in a museum. There'll be a book. And I've done 60 artists. I did one this morning in about four months. So it's on a little bit different time frame and stuff on here and there. Um, and that's, I love that. I mean, they to be able to walk into like art, be able to walk into an artist studio and see how they work and see their work and connect in that way. It's just every part of it is good, from the shooting the portraits to meeting the artists to seeing their work. And in this case, it's a commissioned project, so I'll have another book in an exhibition. I have it. But these are some of the 8 by 10 when I was shooting with the large format. And I just, you know, these are things that were all iconic to me. That was the, the little gym that I grew up in. All I ever wanted to do was play in the NBA. Wrong, <laughs> wrong thing to wish for. Um, my uncle, uh, he and his mother lived together, he had polio um, as a kid. So they would take her and drive it up. Um, she lived to be 106. And I remember going out to one night with dinner and we came home. I think she was about 103 or 4 at the time. And the next day I saw him and said, you know, how was your evening? He's like, Mama was so pissed off at me. <laughs> <laughs> and it made me realize that as long as you have a character that you're not never not somebody's kid. He was probably like 79 or so. And he was catching hell from his mom. <laughs> but they would take turns riding up. This is the house that I grew up in. Um, Mama died in 89 and 80 and 2000. That kitchen hasn't changed. <laughs> since before she died. And my brother and two sisters and I still have the house. And I go there all the time. I've been spending about a week a month there. Um, and just threw down the whole portrait of that house, the whole series, and the temple I grew up in. So, and you mentioned that these are large formats. These are all shot with the big 8 by 10 camera. The kind that you like throw the, the no, belt over here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You shoot it with a big sheet of one sheet of like an 8 by 10 print with a negative 8 by 10. Wow. So you have incredible sharpness, but you, yeah. have to, you have to be really deliberate. There was a time I really liked that. I don't have the patience. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sort of leads into my next question. Did, I, mean, I know that you do shoot digital currently. Is there anything that you miss about film, or is it the cameras? The cameras? I was talking to two men in the back. I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. Forgive me. But we were talking about it earlier. I used to have Leicas. I used to have Hasselblads. I still have my gear to work. And a friend said to me one day, he said, the new cameras have no soul. <laughs> and I still love my Leica. You pick it up and there's something about it. And I had these old cannons laying around and 
I don't know if I had any of the other Nikon was the first digital, but they just they're disposable. They're like computers. You have a laptop in three or five years, it's outdated, you get a new one and you just kind of put it away. The other cameras, the Dior I've had for 40 something years. And the lens that I shoot with belonged to a friend of my father's who was a photographer in Atlanta. Uh, and he had retired and when he got married, but years later he gave me that lens. That lens is probably this 1930s vintage. Yeah. That I put on a 1950s camera. And it still works as you know, as good as any as it did when it was brand new. Yeah. You could do a small book on your equipment. <laughs> The, the amount of equipment that I let go, you know, I could fill this room. I wish I had it all. Yeah, that's interesting. So, do you have any interest in? I mean, we didn't discuss this earlier, but do you have any in, in interest in like the history of photography or optics in general? Just what it does for me. I mean, the, the ones that the history that I'm I'm interested in is the pieces that I have. There's certain cameras I don't, I'll never get rid of the digital no matter what. You know. Um, they, like I said, they, they become part of you. I'm sure, like if you're a musician, you have a guitar, your first guitar that you, you know, you just, you know, you just, you know, you get connected to them. But the digital, I, the camera I'm shooting with now is incredible. That in a few years I'll have something else, and it won't, it won't hold that connection that I have now. It'll age out with a firmware update or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot of times, you know, you get a new camera, you have to get a new computer, you get a new computer. Camera doesn't talk to it. You know, you're forced in the uh, forced obsolescence the technology. <coughs> so when you were shooting in film, what were you did you have a, a dark room? Were you I developing in the dark? I had, you know, uh, dirt and larges and lights, both of them everything myself. And, uh, <coughs> I quickly realized if you talk to most photographers that I know. It's all about the process, and now we talk about the magic of the dark room and all that. Um, I loved that when I was really young, and I realized that my process is camera in hand, being out of the field. Or shooting a corporate dead shot. I still do some of that. I, I love making pictures and connecting with the person I'm shooting or connecting with the landscape. You know, I, I, like, I like the camera. Um, a quick, funny story is I was talking to my gallerist one day in Atlanta, and I had an old Nikon in my hand. We were walking around the studio looking at pictures, and I kept, you know, copying it like you do the other cabinet with a little blinder. And I'd copy my focus, and I'd buy it, and I'd do it again, and I'd do it again. She finally said, what do you have in that cabinet? You, you know, I said, roll up there. I'm like, no, just frame it. <laughs> yeah, I just like to frame it. Uh, it's just that idea of seeing what's in that frame. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I heard some gasps, excited gasps, when I mentioned the uh, Atlanta Hawks photography. Yeah, yeah. Is, could you could you tell us a little bit about that experience and also your your corporate photography? Well, that came from me wanting to play basketball, and I worked for the guy who was on the mountain with Aaron, and, and he did special effects photography, and we needed a picture of a basketball player for TNT job, and we did all these long exposures. And they were going to buy a picture from a guy who became a friend later of Larry Bird in the free throw line. And this is 1984, I think, was the first year I shot. And then, at that point, the guy wanted like three or four thousand dollars for a picture of Larry Bird in the free throw line. Yeah. And I said, Get me a pass from TNT and I can get the shot. And as they did that, and they gave me a pass, it happened to be for the year. And the next year, I went back to the marketing guy and said, Can I shoot? And the Hawks were never that great. There wasn't that much. So I ended up shooting for 15 years, from 80, 82 to 97. The best year, Larry Bird, Magic, and the Dream Team. <laughs> it was great. Michael Jordan. It's incredible. It was really good. It was really good. It really was. So, when, were you were you specifically focusing on sporting events with your corporate work, or did you? No, work? because that was the only thing I did was sporting. Events. Really? Wow. Yeah. Just just. And it was a money loser. Really? Because <laughs> <laughs> they weren't buying anything from me. They had this guy cutting in who still worked with them in the NBA, 
but they just allowed me to shoot. So I went and shot, I think it's 41 home games plus the playoffs. I average at least 40 games a year, and I go down and shoot six or eight rolls of film, and I'm processed. And, you know, so it's cost me money. And they never used a single one of my images. <laughs> but I've got notebooks full of them, but I have to do something with them. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, well, that would be an awesome book. Yeah. yeah, one of these days I'll find time. <laughs> well, I do know that we we have a lot of slides here that you, you have graciously assembled for us. So if there's if there's anything else that you want, to with you, no, no, turn back through it. Because I noticed that when I was walking through this exhibit, getting ready for this artist talk tonight, I noticed that we don't actually have any of your black and white work. But a lot of a lot of what appears on the slide presentation is black and white. Well, in June 2001, I got my first digital camera. I had no interest in, in, in personally shooting color work. I mean, everything I shot was Hasselblad, like uh, in the field, on the street, black and white. And I had a client that needed something quick, and I lost a job because I didn't have a digital camera. So I sold another camera and bought a digital camera. And at the same time that happened, the papers that I liked were beginning to disappear. The act before Trigo was the first one that went away, and then Tony Gangler went away. And I couldn't get the papers I wanted, and the films were disappearing. And, then, and, then I was, and I was enjoying the digital. It was like, well, I can create what, my, what I want now. And I just kind of moved that way. Um, and shining black and white film, the book facing south has a lot of black and white portraits in it. Some of them are early film work, some of them. Or converted. Um, I'll see if I have some of those. But this was some of the, the early um, corporate work. Um, this is incredible projects. They went to farms all around the southeast. And in advertising, they used to give you a layout and say, here's the image we want you to try to get. And they go to these farms and it didn't exist after the art director designed something. So they decided to just send me out, let me shoot cool pictures. And then they were designing the ad based on what I shot. So, I mean, it was a great job. So, was, were you sort of able to experiment and play around with the ideas of photographing the Black Belt or the American South during that those those projects where you were assigned? I always used to go home and shoot whenever I was home, I would shoot. But I didn't, the, the idea of doing shows and fine art and, or whatever that is. Never really, I never thought about it until 2004. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, I did, I did the big going to some gallery to see there was an Abaddon show where he did in the American West at the High Museum. It was incredible. So I knew that things like that existed, but I was busy doing commercial work. And the artist series, I used to always say that when I call an artist, I said, well, one day I hope there'll be an exhibit in a book. But I don't think I ever really believed or thought about it because I was busy with my commercial. And then it just it slowly changed. So when I used to go to Sam, I always had a camera and always shot, but not with any focus. And then after I started doing the panoramas, I started learning a little bit more and, and focusing on bodies of work instead of just random images that I saw. Mm -hmm. You know, to the detriment sometimes. Because now sometimes I'll see something and go and shoot it. But I don't know where does it fit. And so I'm trying to get back to that. That joy and freedom of you know shooting cracks in the sidewalk or whatever that you see that you just think is interesting. I lost some of that along the way of doing all this. So there's a, there's always that balancing act. Yeah, I mean I, I, I know when I first got my camera and all of all of my friends got their cameras. The very first photos we took were like, oh my, my feet look really right. Cool. Yeah. Right. This, this is the beauty of digital now. You can shoot as much you know. I like shooting without conscience. <laughs> you know, I used to walk out of my life in the French Quarter going, I only got two more levels of film, so you had to be, you know, it's not worth it. Now everything is worth it. <laughs> <laughs> and you end up where you're getting your cards get empty, you just go back and delete a bunch of things real quick that you know aren't good. So it, it's a different mindset. So do you find that you're you're less precious because you have <coughs> more gigabytes, so to speak, than rather than 36 exposures? I worked really hard on that because for a while there it was just, it was almost machine gun shooting. You know, because you'd see something you'd like and you'd just go back and back. Then all of a sudden you have to edit all these pictures. So now I'm 
a lot more deliberate. I'm probably not back to film days, but I've done a lot more deliberate on what I shoot. You know, I like the computer, but I don't want to edit 2,000 images at the end of the week. Could you tell us a little bit about the editing process and what that looks like? <laughs> it's just sitting in front of the computer and, you know, especially with portraits. This kind of work is a lot different. If I shoot Love Bug, I probably shot six or eight frames of her on me, you know, uh, maybe a 10 or 12, but there's not that much. I shot a portrait yesterday morning up in Camden, and we were, you know, I only shot about an hour and a half. I probably had about 350 images. But when I see something I like and I see it and I like the expression, I go bang, 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 you know, because you never know when I'm moving a little bit. There's something about when you shoot a portrait. If you put four or five of them in the sequence, there's always one that there's something in their eyes that, that sparks. There's always one that has that magic in it. Um, so when you're editing a lot of portraits, I do one better, two better, like one, and then I throw one away, and then I go to the next one, go one better, two better. And it takes a lot of time. Um, a lot of you can edit really quick with eyes closed or body position way right. It takes a lot of time. So you're, you're, so you're mostly cropping and sort of finding it. You're not really like touching the earth. I don't think about the crop. I just go, this is the best shot. Okay. And then later I'll go back. And if there needs to be. A lot of photographers, I just had an argument with a weapon I instructor from 1981. He's still a friend. And we were arguing about whether or not you should crop an image. <laughs> and I absolutely crop everything. I keep everything in the exact format. So I'm shooting 35 millimeter, everything is cropped to two by three. And if I'm shooting with my new camera, it's three by four. It's always three by four. Um, but I'm shooting a portrait of the guy yesterday, and I, he was in a good place, I was in a good place. I could have stepped forward, I could have moved the tripod, sometimes it's handheld, but then it changes the thing, and it's easier to have that space because I know there's enough digital, you know, megapixels and all, just to go with the moment, and I can crop it. Sometimes, you know, I, I need a longer lens, but I'll just shoot it and come in. You can't, you don't always have the lens you need at the moment you need it, and I like the uh, the ability to do that. With the portrait work, I love square format. From the other days, I'm shooting out some left. With a, just used to shoot that constantly on my portrait, so I still love the square format. And I see something in square. If I see a picture, I'm like, oh, that's better square. There's too much noise on the edge or whatever. And so there's a lot of my images that are shot three by four that are cropped square. But I usually see that when I'm shooting. And so that's the only time I deviate from the format that I'm shooting. And you mentioned that you're photographing some artists, and we're, we're happy to hear that you were able to meet a few, not quite locals, but adjacent to locals. In the area, one in Alcoa. Okay, so yeah, yeah I, very close. Yeah. Just a few minutes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, without naming names, uh, could you tell us how you went about selecting those southern artists? Well, actually, I did. Us? I didn't select. Okay. Um, the curator and the director of the museum made the select. And the reason I'm glad I did is there's only 75 artists. I'm sure somebody's going to be not happy that somebody they didn't do they knew didn't get in or. Why didn't this artist get in? Why didn't this one get in? You know, you know, somebody's going to be unhappy. They always are, for whatever reason. You know. Well, I mean, but I don't have to make that choice. I was given a, a list, and I've just been pursuing it. It's been great. That's excellent. It's busy. I mean, when I'm out shooting for this project, I've been shooting twelve a week, so it's busy. You know. And mostly, you're driving. Yeah, you know, like when I'm at the Charleston, I, yeah, there's a lot in the Charleston area. I was able to do 12 within that, you know, I might go out to John's out, but it was all within that area. Now it's getting a little bit harder. This worked out really great because I kept trying to figure out how to get to the guy in Akalu, so he's not near anywhere else, you know. And now I was in Columbia, and I went out to Swansea, I went to Camden, I went to Akalu, you know. So it's getting out into the fringes now. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sure that you saw a lot of interesting things that. Oh, yeah, good. <laughs> I, won't, I won't ask about this. 
Well, uh, if, if you'd like to show us some more of your slides, I think there's some of the, the advertising things, the corporate work. So it's a Coca Cola ad we can sell? Yeah, you should do a lot of work for Coca Cola. I think I see something we used. The guy I worked for did a lot of it, and then I picked up from him. We did a lot of stuff for you. We made uh, made jello so that you could put jello in and put um, what did I think? acrylic ice cubes. You didn't just shoot put coke in a in a glass with ice, it didn't look right. So you made jello that would sit and then you put ice cubes in and put more jello in. Or if we were shooting like a cup like this in the studio, you'd have a little piece of aluminum foil in the back and you put thermal cells and put water in it so you'd get the fizz <laughs> not the gum. You know, uh, Arrington was a master at it. He would and an airbrush, and he would airbrush the condensation on the bottles. So I mean it was it's pretty amazing what they used to do with food. I don't think they allow you to do that anymore. <laughs> and purpose it weren't eaten, you know, weren't cooked. They were just colored. You know, using something to build so it looked like a charm on it. Yeah. It was it was quite an interesting world in the advertising. Especially with food. Yeah, truth and advertising. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were just lard and something mixed together so that you could fall in the way you Yeah. And it was a perfect ice cream. Right. Yeah, it could make a perfect power. Oh, that's great. And well, um, you know color <laughs> power go back to this color power. When I was working for the Boys and Girls Club, it was a corporate office, and they would send me to Tahlequah, Oklahoma, to shoot with a trail of tears, and and we shot kids. There's a kid I, shot, I wish I had it, uh, Justin Muskrat, and he had on the full dress, um, and it was one of those things. It was all eagle feathers. And you're not allowed to have eagle feathers, even if you're flying it on the ground. And he had it on. And it was a windy, gray day. I love the darkness of the sky. But they said if that eagle feather falls out, he won't pick it up. He can't pick it up. Mm -hmm. We'll have to have the elder from the tribe come and get it and the shoot will be over. Mm -hmm. He will stop because him doing that dance for us was like a preacher preaching. I mean it was not just okay, we're gonna dance and do this thing. He it was serious. Um, so that was the whole boys and girls club. The Colin Powell was on their corporate board. So I shot him with six kids and 13 kids. They wanted to do the same with him. And I wanted this portrait, because I knew that I did a portrait of him that would help me with my work. <laughs> and so I shot the six kids, I shot him with 13 kids, and I had the dual setup stuff. So I said, if I can get you for just a minute, sir. He walked to the other set, I fired twice, and the circuit breaker went. We kicked the circuit breaker. So we had to unplug two packs, find other places to plug them in, kept shooting. I think I only shot one roll of 120 and a few 35 millimeter, and thanked him and he walked out and it was 13 minutes. So you really had to be prepared on shoots like that. Um, I shot the CEO of South Trust Corporation and it was a board meeting and we weren't not gonna have much time. We had the light set up, we were ready, and this was the days of filming. And Wallace Malone walked in and shook his hand and said, thank you, and stand here. And I shot a pic, uh, Polaroid, handed it over my shoulder to my assistant, and I started shooting. And after 30 seconds, the black and white Polaroid was ready, and she said, you're good, keep going. And I shot two rolls of film, grabbed my 35 again, and thanked him, and he left. And I said, what are we doing, buddy? She said, three minutes. <laughs> That's how much time we had with the CEO. You know, you have to be ready. Uh, but this one, because I shot Colin Powell, I was a member of American Society of Media Photography, an ASMP, which is an old organization. And because that was on my ASMP site, when people needed photographers in Atlanta, they could look up across the board and see who they wanted to pick and look at portfolios. And because I had shot this picture and this picture, it made me look good. I'm not saying I'm a better photographer than you're looking at other people. And also, you go, know, wow, they shot Jimmy Carter and they shot Colin Powell. Then they trust me with the CEO or trust me with somebody else. So they were really important pictures in my career. Hank Aaron, Jane Jonathan. This was a 
the managing director of one of the largest farms in Atlanta. And that's been my bread and butter for the last, I mean, that's my commercial clients now, I probably only have three left, and they're all attorneys, large attorney groups uh, that I do quote and pay shots. So you currently live in Atlanta, I live in Atlanta. But in, in your years of photographing uh, Selma, have you noticed, are, are there any changes or are there, like what, what have you noticed, I guess, in, in capturing the South in the way that you have been for the last 30 some odd years? Unfortunately, not much, really. You know, the buildings disappear, people come and go, uh, but the rural South hasn't changed much. You know, people don't want to change. You know, some people do, but not enough. I mean, I'm talking from what I know about Selma. Selma has a tremendous opportunity because of the Pettus Bridge and Martin Luther King walking the bridge. Every time I'm there, I see busloads of people. People drive in and walk the bridge. But there's no restaurants in town. You know, there's like two restaurants from the, the whole downtown area. There's not on Saturday and Sunday. You get Anywhere to eat. There's an old depot museum, there's the civil rights museum, and they're closed on Saturday and Sunday. And for some reason, they don't understand. And people come on the weekend and they come up So people drive from Montgomery, they go to the, the Lynching Memorial and the Equal Justice Institute, and they're doing the, the civil rights trail. And they go to Birmingham and they go to Montgomery, and they come to Salmon and they don't stay. And there's a lot of history there, there's some war history. There's, uh, Rufus King, William Rufus King was the Vice President of the United States. It's very, it's just a lot of history. Architecture, it's a lot to see. But people won't stay because there's nothing to do. And it's just, people don't want to change. They want it to be like it was, but they don't want to be what it was. When I was a kid, Selma was thriving at 17,000 arrows, almost 30. But there was an Air Force base there. They closed in 77, and that's really what kind of made the slide. And bad, bad city government you know, for hmm. how many is that? 40 something years now? <laughs> so, but that's been a lot because it's home. And I love the rural stuff, I love the people. It just, it doesn't, there's not a lot of change like you see in Atlanta or you know, Charlotte or you know, Columbia, Bravo. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and, and what you're doing is you're documenting slices of rural life, but you're also sort of creating a record of places, institutions yeah. that are maybe torn down or yeah. maybe falling into disrepair. Um, it it could change too much, but it is a contemporary view. I mean, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, there's probably, you know, there's a sign to get the, the cross in there, but I'm not a big fan of cuts and covered barns and, and Rusted signs. Um, my friend Susan always referred to that as the ruins and remembrances of the South. Mm -hmm. And you see that a lot. Um, but mine is more a contemporary view of what's going on now in the, in the 20, I guess we have the 21st century. Because all the images, and I think, I'm trying to think what's in the other room. All of these images were made between 2002 and last year. In this room specifically? In, in both rooms. Both. There, there's a few images that were in the book. There were early slides, but everything in here was done in 2015. Mm -hmm. And it started with this panorama and the orange one in the other room. And is this, is, is, does this corner still appear that way? or It still looks like still that. Open. At that point, it was still open. That was an early, early Sunday morning. They just closed the, the Washington Street Market about a year ago. Mm -hmm. But it looks exactly like that. But nobody, nobody there. Mm -hmm. And it was always a hangout. You always saw people sitting, you know, on the benches just hanging out, you know, catching up with other people. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure we can all relate to having a corner store or something that we all used And that's why right downtown, that's a, a, a block from the Pettus Bridge. Um, I think a place like that would be jumping next to a landmark like that. It's just, you know, there's not that many people that live downtown. There. It's, it's only two, three minutes to the neighborhoods, but it's not. I'm not sure.
sure what, you know, now there's a Super Bowl on. Everybody knows there's a Super Bowl. <laughs> you know, I, I go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'd like to open it. I should have opened it up earlier, but if, if anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask, feel free to. Who does your play and your frame? Do you have one company that does this for you? I do all the printing myself. Do you do the framing also? I have one framer that's done it since 2000. Oh, okay. And she builds these frames. They're uh, uh, you came for them. There was another photographer right there named Woody Brooks, and he introduced me to Caroline Bud at the paper frame. And she calls this frame with Woody because Woody asked her to build it. And I'm the only one that uses it now, but she's been building this for me since 2000. I, I will say this is one of the most consistent size shows I've ever done, which well, is much appreciated. What's nice is they cut the wood, they build the frame, but depending on the size, the thickness changes, depending, you know, that one has a thicker okay. profile, but it's the same stain, it's the same. That I do. So, um, my father was from Wilcox family. Oh, yeah. Yes, and my brother and I still live. Family mm -hmm. Are any of these from Wilcox County? Any residents there? I've been shooting in Wilcox County because I've got a friend down there and he always said, Why don't you ever come to Wilcox? Um, Union Town. So, what's from Union Town? Um, I'm trying to think what's in the show here. He was out in a little community called Mina, which doesn't exist anymore, but the, our family still lives in the family. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then just on the other side of the river from G's Bend. Yeah, yeah G's Bend. Yeah. First time I've heard that when I was little. Oh, really? G's Bend, yeah, when, you know, didn't know it existed. Yeah. And they have a tournament going on right now. Yeah, they do. <laughs> There's like, unfortunately, like, it's great for them, but there's like four or five factions down there now. Yeah. And there's a group that's working with, I think, Bergdorf in New York. And. And they have a target line, and then they have another group that's just putting together, and Berger was it, putting together the fabrics, and then they will rework out. But there's a couple of groups that do real, you know, doing high-end stuff. What's his name on it? The guy from the Roots, the drummer. He, when he won a Grammy, he had on a cheese bag coat, and this was like four or five years ago. Did he have any exhibits anywhere? Any exhibits? Any, any, yeah. uh, no exhibits down there now. Um, Hale County. I've done a lot of Hale County and Perry County. Oh. <laughs> I've, been, I've been to Camden, um, Snow Hill. Do you know the Snow Hill Institute? That, yes. yes. I have a show that's coming up in Birmingham that's all about Snow Hill Institute. That's where. Um, Lionel Richie went there and Spike Lee's family. Spike Lee, Spike Lee's family. It's just and it was a school that was, I think it was started in 1924 by a guy who was a Tuskegee graduate. Mm -hmm. And it started with, I forget how many groups of like three or four students. It grew to like over 400 students and 17 buildings there. Um, and I just stumbled on it one day driving around. And I, you know, you make another call, or call somebody in Camden or send somebody out. We found a descendant and so I wanted to shoot there and they said, Great. And I said, Well, the door like you just climb in the window like you've been here. <laughs> <laughs> but that's where things have changed because I used to climb in windows all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Every photographer does. And if you see an old friend, it's okay. You know, you've got a camera. You've got a camera, people thought you were okay. You know. But now you can't do it. I mean, the first time I went there, I climbed in the window. And I shot for about 30 minutes and I got just too anxious and I left and they didn't get permission. You know, I mean, who was it the other day? Somebody pulled in the driveway to turn around and it was the wrong driveway and they got shot. You know, and I used to pull over and talk to kids in the neighborhoods. And I just, I don't like, I'm not comfortable doing it anymore. You know, I'm going to get shot or I'm going to get abused or something. You know, we're in a terrible climate right now. Uh, so it's affected the way I shoot. You know, I shot her because her family was there. You know, she was there with them. Okay. 
You even had coming up photographic idol that you were trying to emulate. As coming up what? A photographic idol that you were trying to emulate. I don't think there's anybody I've ever I've tried to emulate. There were people that inspired me and wanted to make me shoot. You know, my wife laughs at me all the time. We went to a, a show and it was a high museum and it was called a long arc and it was photography from the 1860s to the present. And as we were walking out, I said, damn, it makes me want to be a photographer. <laughs> <laughs> so then there's, there's constantly stuff that inspire me. There was a time when there was a couple of photographers who were really popular and selling a lot of work. And it's like, I'm a commercial photographer. I can do that work. And I did some of those pictures, but if it's not something if it's not something that you're invested in, that your heart connects to, in my opinion, it's not as good. It goes back to the guy who's from New York who shot in Alabama. His pictures are flat out gorgeous. They're 48 by 60, but they're cold. They're like illustrations of the South. When you're connected to the work, when you're connected to the people, this um, little girl I shot, the day that I went there, I stopped and I said, you know, I get out without my camera and I say, I'm a photographer, I document the South, you know, I grew up around here, my father had some property down the road, which was true, you know, he used to come around here, I said, can I take some pictures, I saw y'all hanging out, and the guys, you know, kind of, and I said, I don't want you to pose, I just want you to be who you are, just let me kind of hang out with y'all for a minute, <coughs> and I ended up staying for almost two hours with him. Um, this was the guy, and we found, you find these common friends, and you connect with people, you know, somehow we started coming out motorcycles, which I used to ride when I was a kid, I took this picture, I took this picture, and I, you know, sent that to my wife later that night, and she said, do you know what that is? I said, I did you know, I knew they had the Confederate flag, so I knew that we were in lockstep on our, our beliefs. But that's the SS tattoo. Yeah. You know, and you know, I, I joke about it now because I'm glad I didn't have my yarmulke on. You know, <laughs> right? But here's a group, you know, a husband and a wife, their two kids, this guy. We had not completely, you know, if we hadn't gone down certain paths, it probably had not been pleasant. We talked about Alabama football, we talked about motorcycles, we talked about, I don't even remember what, I was there for an hour, 45 minutes, two hours, photographed a little girl, um, the postcard that came out was a little boy, it's like a little boy on the tricycle, that's the same family, I've been back several times, almost the same, same house in the background, different lens, but taken six years apart, the little boy on the tricycle wasn't even born yet. So I can, you connect with people. And that was probably one of the biggest things that I've talked about and learned is, you know, we're so divided right now in this country, and if you just stop and talk to people, we have a lot more in common than we have not in common. Mm -hmm. So that's why I went to that picture. Mm -hmm. And you never know what you'll see. I just saw this other picture. You know, this was a lady I was coming from Montgomery, the back road, back to Selma. I was in a talk at Cali, and I saw her granddaughter dancing on the side of the road, and saw her and her sisters further down the road, and they were picking these wild colors. I never heard of such a thing. And I said, I didn't know they were wild. She said, neither did I. <laughs> and I, she said, I don't know, somebody threw out some seeds, or how that happened, but she had Bushels of them, handfuls. And it would be that much time, you know, I connected with her and I sent a prince of her. And, um, is the girl, is she in the picture? And this is kind of, uh, the girl with the barrettes? There's a little girl with barrettes. I'm not sure if she's in the show. From a technological standpoint in the future, have you ever thought three dimensional? No, I'm old school. <laughs> you know, I 
have a lot of friends who do video now and other things. The light is what I do. The light and the camera, and I want to stay connected, and I know what I'm doing. And I don't know. You never know if something will, you know, trigger something, and you want to try. It. Yeah. You mentioned two thousand four is eight year. You, you haven't been doing something until 2004. So that was the first time. Was that, was that, in your art photography? that was the first time I ever did a show. A show? Yeah. I think 2000, the artist series that I had done, was a little club called Atlanta Photography Group. And I had a couple of friends in that because it was, it was a photo club and I knew some people in it. But I never thought about shows until 2004. And that's when I did a series called Edge. What triggered that? Did that just happen to, you know, not the opportunity for that show to happen? My, and that just grew from there? Or? My studio was behind the lab. It was a big 8,000 square foot building. at 2,000 square feet in the back. And so I went to the lab every day. I just hung out up front when I wanted to shoot it. And a lady came in, and I met so many people in that lab. People bringing in a woman that was in the fun and who was a huge benefactor of the arts, became a great friend. This woman, Marcia Cavalier, was there processing film, and we started talking one day. And they just said, "You ought to see his work." So we went back to my studio, and she was holding a brand new gallery. And said, "Do you want to show some of this work?" I'm like, I guess so. So that was the first show I did, and, and then after that, it's fine. <coughs> and I thought, well, actually, I'd been working on the artist series, and I thought my Showing more of that work and doing that, that it would help my commercial work the way Colin Powell did and Jimmy Carter did. By doing a book and doing more shows, it would go, well, he's a great photographer, he's also an artist. You know, so I thought that would really boost the work. I don't know if I didn't do enough self promotion, but, you know. If I guess one more, you mentioned the project you're working on now for the South Carolina artists. Is there a museum in this picture? Or that? There's a Where can we see that? You can see it in, I'll have to let you know, I'm not supposed to get out of the end of next year, not fall of next year. There'll be a book in the next year. But you're all sworn to see it. <laughs> <laughs> and a question in the back. Yes, um, doing corporate, um, this documenting the artists that you're doing now, do you have permission to go there and so forth? They're expecting you. But would you talk a little bit more about when you walk up cold to people like Fanny or Guy or, uh, you know, more about your approach? And, you know, I mean, people, you know, they have to gain the trust. You know, you say, well, I can shoot this, I want to shoot this scene over here. But then you pick the camera and put it on them. So I give my parents just, credit for the way I've been raised, I guess. You know, I mean, the, the, the trick is you have to connect with somebody. You know, a big smile and a hello goes a long way. Uh, you know, I never pick up the camera and try to shoot something without saying hello. Um, when I got out to shoot this family, you know, I have two or three cameras in the front seat, but I got out without any camera and just, hey, how y'all doing? And started talking, you know. We had property around here. It was a few minutes before I said I'm a documentary photographer. And I, can, I feel confident saying that now. There's a picture that I did of another gentleman on his front porch in a wheelchair without legs. And I must have driven past his house like 10 times trying to figure how do I take this picture? And I was probably 24, 25 years old and was not thinking about any of this stuff. But I, I ended up saying to him that day, I, I shoot pictures in the South and I'm trying to document the area where I grew up. But it's but if you connect with people, the main thing is just, you know, if you're small and open, you know, some of these buzzwords that I hate, but if you're authentic and honest about what you're doing and you talk to people, it's very rarely that I have someone say, no, no, go away. Well, what about posing? You know, I'm looking at Betty right here. Um, no, she, she, I, let her, she let you in her house. That's actually, um, it's a sort of a museum. Okay. She, her grandparents, um, grandmother was from Cheese Bend. Okay. And was one of the first people to organize the quilting piece there. 
um, and the other side, her, the other side of the building, her father owns shoe shop. So that shoe shop is still there, and she's kept them sort of like museums. And people come and visit. <clears throat> she was in the twin tower. When the twin towers went down, and she was in the subway in New York. She was in living in New York, and so now she makes dolls and other textile art. Did you have her looking out? Um, this is it was just one of those things that happened, you know. I, I don't, I don't close people. Okay. I, you know, even when I'm shooting the artist portraits, and they know I'm there, you know, it's like, you know, if something's not working, it's like do something different. Walk away from the easel, come back, you know, you know, do something different. Because I always say that there's other photographers that come into the studio and say. Now, this is great. I love this. I'm going to put a light here. I'm going to move this to here. And they'll create a perfect portrait. To me, what I'm trying to do is capture that person. And it's the best compliment I've ever gotten is when they say, You captured a photograph of a little girl in her christening ground. It was the first time somebody said it to me. And Buffy said, You caught me in exactly the way I know. And I heard that from Ida Goldmeyer, who was an artist. Her daughter said, thank you for the print. Somehow you captured my mom the way I know her. You always send a print to me. And so, yes. yeah. Do you have any copyright concerns here? There's always concerns. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't do as good a job as I should about copywriting everything. But if you copyright it, then somebody, you know, just had this conversation recently, said, it's an automatic judgment if it's stolen and you have a copyright. If the image is not copyrighted, you can still win the case, but it becomes a much bigger battle. Did you put your image in that city? It was a series I did of a woman named Geraldine, and she was 80 something and was not, didn't have all the facilities. But I saw her at this BP station getting breakfast every morning, and I started photographing her. And probably 60 pictures, and one day she had a blonde wig, and one day she had a red wig, and she had all this plastic jewelry, and, you know, she, she was fascinating, and we kind of became friends. I seen that picture show up, I had so many people comment and say, I saw it again on Facebook, and it's for a wrinkle cream, because she's 80 years old, oh, wow. but for me to try to track that down, you know, the amount of time, energy, money to do it, you know, but there's certain images that are copyrighted because they're, um, I hate the word iconic, but iconic images for me, the girl with the gun, the homecoming, there's certain images that, you know, I want to protect myself. Yeah, you know, right. So, you, those are ones that you register for copyright? Because the copyright is whether they're registered or not. Yeah, but if it's not registered, if it's registered, you have a much stronger case. Mm -hmm. <laughs> When you look at the camera, when do you see the dress of the book? It's not what I see, it's how I see it. You know, it's just, you know, what we've been seeing, as somebody said this to me, you know, the things that you drive by every day, it's just a matter of slowing down and looking. I'm not seeing anything different than anybody else. So you, it's just the way that I look at it. You know, I'm, there's a this came from a body of work I did in Atlanta. And somebody said, I recognize that. I said, I don't work with it. I said, I drive by that every day. I thought it looked familiar. But if you don't stop when you're driving and look, you just drive right past stuff. Instead you know? of stopping and smelling the roses, you stop and take a picture. Take a Right. Somebody, a photographer, said to me once, and somebody asked him, What's the most important thing that you do when you're out shooting? He said, put it reverse and go back. <laughs> um, you know, you always drive past and go, oh, you know. And I find myself all the time backing up down the interstate or on the country road, or, you know, swirling around and doing that. Do you concern yourself with model releases at all? With the model releases? I should more. Um, when you start asking for a model release, it changes the dynamics. You know, um, for me to put a picture of Betty or her in here, I don't have to have a model release. Really. I really don't have to have it to put it in a book. Somebody can litigate, even if you have a release, they can still litigate. Um, as long as you're not using it for advertising or something, 
you know, to promote a product. You know, it's it's art. You know, it's a weird term, but but I try to. Um, I've asked this family for model and things, and I haven't gotten one from Betty. But I always, because I get their addresses, I know that I can reach them because I send prints. And there's some that I just feel comfortable doing it. Uh, that was really difficult when I did the army series because when I met them, I was young and I didn't want to say, I might have an exhibit when they would sign this release and they're like, well, what's the release for? And it just changes the dynamics of just sitting down and saying, hey, how are you? Let's have a conversation and tell me about what you do. And when you start bringing in paperwork, everything changes. And it was hard when I did Face the South. It was out of 100 artists. They were like nine that had died because it was all late career artists. So I had to find addresses and find next of kin and somebody else. And it was difficult. But, you know. Have you ever had a regret that you wish you had? You know, it's one of those things that you want to think back about. There's an image that I wish I stopped and had done something. I saw it, but I didn't have my camera. And it goes back to the early 80s, there was a cold, cold winter night, I stopped to see a friend at Christmas, and they were deer hunting, and there was a, a swing set, and it had the swings on it anymore, and the deer was hung up, and they were gutting the deer, and there was a light going with a cord out of the back door through a tree to another tree, to a lamp, and the lamp was hung upside down without the shade, and that's what they were using for the light. And there were these guys, three or four guys, standing around with beers and camos, and one of them got the deer. And you know the famous picture of that Steichen did with the steam coming off the horses? The steam was coming off of this deer. And so it was just, I mean, it's, it's in my mind, but I didn't have my camera at that point. Yeah. Didn't you shoot something that, like, other people could consider controversial. You've never put it into contextualizing that. I don't know. I feel like I got it. Yeah, yeah. Because there's a body of work that I just did that was just at the museum in LSU. Uh, and it was on their equities. And when I shot, when I first started, the first time I shot their equities was in, this was a, uh, this was sort of a, a campy thing in Halloween. But this guy cut my wife's hair and cut my hair. And he did drag. And we talked about it. I said, let's do some pictures. So he came to the studio there and with my light in the background. Yeah, this was 96, 97. And I showed pictures with him. And he came in and did the makeup and then that's him in drag. And I didn't do anything for a long time. And then I met this guy. Who was a dancer who was working with a, a friend. And I liked the, the difference of the dancer of day and drag queen at night. I asked him to shoot. But what I realized is most of them drag queen in their full profession, they don't have two things like what Josh did. But that body of work, to your point, is yeah, a lot of people want to contextualize it and want to ask me about it. When I shot that work in 20. 2017 was when I shot Rajiv and the rest of the world was another 2018. It was a great show, the gallery loved it, I got written up in the paper, but there was nothing said about it. Now it got shown at LSU, I'm supposed to go to a school in Western Carolina, because now drag is topical. And it's become, you know, politicized, and it's become a whole different thing. So the way I talk about it is different, because to me it was just a, another uh, continuation of shooting portraits of people. A little bit different context because they were drag queens and, and what I was doing was a part of a deal. So I would shoot in full key shoot, what they call it, and slowly take it away in the last picture. It was, and I'd never met her. And when they showed up, they were in full makeup. She didn't have her dress and her hair on, but she was had on a plaid shirt and jeans, but full makeup. And that's how she, she showed up at the studio. And then so we took it away, so I didn't know uh, 
between this blue and a going to a play so we were completely through with the shoot uh, and then in the middle I did stuff like this that showed this is how he made his garbage thicker he, he cut these things out of foam and put on six pair of pantyhose because <laughs> that's how he smooths out his legs and he was you know he's incredibly so out. much for online day. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's funny how things have changed contextualized um the picture of the girl with the gun when i shot that picture in 2009 i think it became a really popular image and it was in several shows uh but it was i think it was a little before the 2016 came about and things changed politically and then also in that picture at homecoming which people just you know thought of as typical traditional southern sort of imagery and, what, and i've had people ask me multiple times what were you thinking when you shot the confederate flag and i honestly honestly i didn't see the flag i saw a girl with a gun and a bunch of color and then the sounds of the, the fair and the smell of the cotton candy and the cozy dogs that's a corn dog sound you know they call it cozy dogs you just have a cozy dog that's what i remembered i don't i honestly didn't see the flag because at that point in 2009 it wasn't politicized like it is now i'm sure there were people that you know people went out and they had that confederate flag but it wasn't like it is now the hoop starts became a really big deal That's itself. It's called the old line of the symbol. Yeah. It's yeah. called the line of the Yes. Yes. That's itself. Yes. Yeah. It's a beautiful old symbol, too. Very, very nice. Yeah. And I don't know where we are time wise, but we'll have this one the last question. In your opinion, what makes a picture a great picture? <laughs> Easy one for last. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You know, I mean, if it touches people, maybe uh, I had a friend who shot pictures and he always should talk about universal, universal truths, T R U T H S. I guess it, you know, it's a great picture of universal, you know, if it touches a lot of people, maybe, you know, all different kinds of people respond to it in some way. But I don't give my work titles per se you know big clothesline love book because that's what it says on the shirt you know painted bus because i don't want people to be influenced by my thoughts you know the way that i feel about the work is the way i feel about it but everybody else has their own feeling about what that means i did a painting once and I showed it to my uncle, and he said, what's the title? I said, I'm title number three. He said, you gotta get me a title. And he said, what was going on when you did it? And I said, sensing the end. And I can't remember him going, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and it was this like expressionistic painting of a face. And he said, no. It's like, well, that's what I was feeling. And that's why you don't give things title because you can influence and color people's thoughts on it. And some people, you know, look at that and think the deer heads are terrible because they don't agree with money. Some people think, boy, I had a big medicine burner a long time, or, you know, what the food was like. Everybody has, brings their own response to the image, and that's what I want. And I just hope that the other response that I got from a friend once is she said, you know, I don't like your work. You know, doesn't mean it's not good. Just for me, it doesn't, you know, I was okay with that, but she had a feeling about it. It made her feel something. I think that's the worst thing you can do is for somebody to walk by and, and not make them feel anything at all. So I guess it's a good picture to make somebody feel something. Connects with them in some way. I guess it doesn't have to be positive. Speaking of <laughs>
Well, thank you everybody for your, your really good questions. Thank you for your